Moby Dick, or, The Whale, by Herman Melville. Chapter 101. The Decanter. Ere the English ship fades from sight, be it set down here, that she hailed from London, and was named after the late Samuel Enderby, merchant of that city, the original of the famous whaling house of Enderby and Sons, a house which in my poor whaleman's opinion, comes not far behind the united royal houses of the Tudors and Bourbons, in point of real historical interest, how long, prior to the year of our Lord 1775, this great whaling house was in existence, my numerous fish documents do not make plain, but in that year, 1775, it fitted out the first English ships that ever regularly hunted the sperm whale, though for some score of years previous, ever since 1726, our valiant coffins and Mackeys of Nantucket and the vineyard had in large fleets pursued that, Leviathan, but only in the North and South Atlantic, not elsewhere. Be it distinctly recorded here, that the Nantucketers were the first among mankind to harpoon with civilized steel the great sperm whale, and that for half a century they were the only people of the whole globe who so harpooned him. In 1778, a fine ship, the Amelia, fitted out for the express purpose, and at the sole charge of the, vigorous Cinderbys, boldly rounded Cape Horn, and was the first among the nations to lower a whaleboat of any sort in the Great South Sea. The voyage was a skillful and lucky one, and returning to her berth with her hold full of the precious sperm, the Amelia's example was soon followed by other ships, English and American, and thus the vast sperm whale grounds of the Pacific were thrown open. But, not content with this good deed, the indefatigable house again bestirred itself, Samuel and all his sons, how many, their mother only knows, and under their immediate auspices, and partly, I think, at their expense, the British government was induced to send the sloop of war Rattler on a whaling voyage of discovery into the South Sea. Commanded by a naval post captain, the Rattler made a rattling, voyage of it, and did some service, how much does not appear. But this is not all. In 1819, the same house fitted out a discovery whale ship of their own, to go on a tasting cruise to the remote waters of Japan. That ship, well called this one made a noble experimental cruise, and it was thus that the great Japanese whaling ground first became generally known. The Srin in this famous voyage was, commanded by a Captain Coffin, a Nantucketer. All honor to the Enderbys, therefore, whose house, I think, exists to the present day, though doubtless the original Samuel must long ago have slipped his cable for the great South Sea of the other world. The ship named after him was worthy of the honor being a very fast sailor and a noble craft every way. I boarded her once at midnight somewhere off, the Patagonian coast, and drank good flip down in the forecastle. It was a fine gam we had, and they were all trumps, every soul on board. A short life to them, and a jolly death. And that fine gam I had, long, very long after old Ahab touched her planks with his ivory heel, it minds me of the noble, solid. Saxon hospitality of that ship, and may my parson forget me, and the devil remember me, if I ever lose sight of it. Flip? Did I say we had flip? Yes, and we flipped it at the rate of ten gallons the hour, and when the squall came, for it's squally off there by Patagonia, and all hands, visitors and all, were called to reef top sails, we were so top heavy that we had to swing each other aloft in bullens and we ignorantly furled the skirts of our jackets into the sails, so that we hung, there, reefed fast in the howling gale, a warning example to all drunken tars. However, the masts did not go overboard, and by and by we scrambled down, so sober, that we had to pass the flip again, though the savage salt spray bursting down the forecastle scuttle, rather too much diluted and pickled it to my taste. The beef was fine, tough, but with body in it. They said it was bull beef, others, that it was dromedary beef, but I do not know, for certain, how that was. They had dumplings too, small, but substantial, symmetrically globular, and indestructible dumplings. I fancied that you could fill them, and roll them about in you after they were swallowed. If you stooped over too far forward, you risked their pitching out of you like billiard balls. The bread, but that couldn't be helped. Besides, it was an anti-scorbutic, 
In short, the bread contained the only fresh fare they had. But the forecastle was not very light, and it was very easy to step over into a dark corner when you ate it. But all in all, taking her from truck to helm, considering the dimensions of the cook's boilers, including his own live parchment boilers, fore and aft, I say, the Samuel Enderby was a jolly ship, of good fare and plenty, fine flip and strong, crack fellows all, and capital from boot heels to hat band. But why was it, think ye, that the Samuel Enderby, and some other English whalers I know of, not although, were such famous, hospitable ships, that passed round the beef, and the bread, and the can, and the joke, and were not soon weary of eating, and drinking, and laughing. I will tell you, the abounding good cheer of these English whalers is matter for historical research. Nor have I been at all sparing of historical whale research, when it has seemed needed. The English were preceded in the whale fishery by the Hollanders, Zealanders, and Danes, from whom they derived many terms still extant in the fishery, and what is yet more, their fat old fashions, touching plenty to eat and drink. For, as a general thing, the English merchant ship scrimps her crew, but not so the English whaler. Hence, in the English, this thing of whaling good cheer is not normal and natural, but incidental in particular, and, therefore, must have some special origin, which is here pointed out, and will be still further elucidated. During my researches in the Leviathanuk histories, I stumbled upon, an ancient Dutch volume, which, by the musty whaling smell of it, I knew must be about whalers. The title was, Dan Koopman, wherefore I concluded that this must be the invaluable memoirs of some Amsterdam cooper in the fishery, as every whale ship must carry its cooper. I was reinforced in this opinion by seeing that it was the production of one Fitzswackhammer. But my friend Dr. Snodhead, a, very learned man, professor of Low Dutch and High German in the College of Santa Claus and Street Pots, to whom I handed the work for translation, giving him a box of sperm candles for his trouble, this same Dr. Snodhead, so soon as he spied the book, assured me that Dan Koopman did not mean the Cooper, but the merchant. In short, this ancient and learned Low Dutch book treated of the commerce, of Holland, and, among other subjects, contained a very interesting account of its whale fishery. And in this chapter it was, headed, smear, or fat, that I found a long detailed list of the outfits for the larders and cellars of 180 sail of Dutch whalemen, from which list, as translated by Dr. Snodhead, I transcribed the following, 400,000 pounds of beef, 60,000 pounds Freslin pork, 150,000 pounds, of stock fish, 550,000 pounds of biscuit, 72,000 pounds of soft bread, 2,800 firkins of butter, 20,000 pounds teaksel and Leiden cheese, 144,000 pounds cheese, probably an inferior article, 550 anchors of Geneva, 10,800 barrels of beer. Most statistical tables are parchingly dry in the reading, not so in the present case, however, where the reader is flooded with whole pipes, barrels, quartz, and gills of, good gin and good cheer. At the time, I devoted three days to the studious digesting of all this beer, beef, and bread, during which many profound thoughts were incidentally suggested to me, capable of a transcendental and platonic application, and, furthermore, I compiled supplementary tables of my own, touching the probable quantity of stock fish, etc., consumed by every low Dutch harpooner in that ancient Greenland and Spitsbergen whale fishery. In the first place, the amount of butter, and teaksel and Leiden cheese consumed, seems amazing. I impute it, though, to their naturally unctuous natures, being rendered still more unctuous by the nature of their vocation, and especially by their pursuing their game in those frigid polar seas, on the very coasts of that Esquimaux country where, the convivial natives pledge each other in bumpers of train oil. The quantity of beer, too, is very large, 10,800 barrels. Now, as those polar fisheries could only be prosecuted in the short summer of that climate, so that the whole crews of one of these Dutch whalemen, including the short voyage to and from the Spitsbergen Sea, did not much exceed three months, say, and reckoning thirty men to each, 
Of their fleet of 180 sail, we have 5,400 low Dutch seamen in all, therefore, I say, we have precisely two barrels of beer per man, for a 12 weeks allowance, exclusive of his fair proportion of that 550 anchors of gin. Now, whether these gin and beer harpooners, so fuddled as one might fancy them to have been, were the right sort of men to stand up in a boat's head, and take good aim at, flying whales, this would seem somewhat improbable. Yet they did aim at them, and hit them too. But this was very far north, be it remembered, where our beer agrees well with the constitution, upon the equator, in our southern fishery, beer would be apt to make the harpoon near sleepy at the masthead and boozy in his boat, and grievous loss might ensue to Nantucket and New Bedford. But no more, enough has been said to show that the old Dutch whalers of two or three centuries ago were high livers, and that the English whalers have not neglected so excellent an example. For, say they, when cruising in an empty ship, if you can get nothing better out of the world, get a good dinner out of it, at least. And this empties the decay. Chapter 102. A Bower in the Arsacids. Hitherto, in descriptively treating of the sperm whale, I have chiefly dwelt upon the marvels of his outer aspect, or separately and in detail upon some few interior structural features. But to a large and thorough sweeping comprehension of him, it behooves me now to unbutton him still further, and untagging the points of his hose, unbuckling his garters, and, casting loose the hooks and the eyes of the joints of his innermost bones, set him before you in his ultimatum that is to say, in his unconditional skeleton. But how now, Ishmael? How is it, that you, a mere oarsman in the fishery, pretend to know aught about the subterranean parts of the whale? Did erudite stub, mounted upon your capstan, deliver lectures on the anatomy of the cetacea, and by, help of the windlass, hold up a specimen rib for exhibition? Explain thyself, Ishmael. Can you land a full-grown whale on your deck for examination, as a cook dishes a roast pig? Surely not. A veritable witness have you hitherto been, Ishmael, but have a care how you seize the privilege of Jonah alone, the privilege of discoursing upon the joists and beams, the rafters, ridgepole, sleepers, and, underpinnings, making up the framework of Leviathan, and Balak of the Tallovitz, dairy rooms, butteries and cheeseries in his bowels. I confess, that since Jonah, few whalemen have penetrated very far beneath the skin of the adult whale, nevertheless, I have been blessed with an opportunity to dissect him in miniature. In a ship I belonged to, a small cub sperm whale was once bodily hoisted to, the deck for his poke or bag, to make sheaths for the barbs of the harpoons, and for the heads of the lances. Thank you I let that chance go without using my boat hatchet and jackknife, and breaking the seal and reading all the contents of that young cub? And as for my exact knowledge of the bones of the Leviathan in their gigantic, full-grown development, for that rare knowledge I am indebted, to my late royal friend Tranquo, King of Trank, one of the Arsacids. For being at Trank, years ago, when attached to the trading ship day of Algiers, I was invited to spend part of the Arsacidian holidays with the Lord of Trank at his retired palm villa at Bupella, a seaside glen not very far distant from what our sailors called Bamboo Town, his capital. Among many other fine qualities, my royal friend Tranquo, being gifted with a devout love for all matters of barbaric virtue, had brought together in Bupella whatever rare things the more ingenious of his people could invent, chiefly carved woods of wonderful devices, chiseled shells, inlaid spears, costly paddles, aromatic canoes, and all these distributed among whatever natural wonders, the wonder freighted, tribute rendering, waves had cast upon his shores. Chief among these latter was a great sperm whale, which, after an unusually long raging gale, had been found dead and stranded, with his head against a cocoa nut tree, whose plumage like, tufted droopings seemed his verdant jet. When the vast body had at last been stripped of its fathom deep enfoldings, and the bones become dust dry in the sun, then the skeleton was, carefully transported up the Pupella Glen, where a grand temple of lordly palms now sheltered it. The ribs were hung with trophies, the vertebrae were carved with arsacidian annals, in strange hieroglyphics, in the skull, 
the priests kept up an unextinguished aromatic flame, so that the mystic head again sent forth its vapory spout, while, suspended from a bow, the terrific lower jaw vibrated, over all the devotees, like the hair-hung sword that so affrighted Damocles. It was a wondrous sight. The wood was green as mosses of the icy glen, the trees stood high and haughty, feeling their living sap, the industrious earth beneath was as a weaver's loom, with a gorgeous carpet on it, whereof the ground vine tendrils formed the warp and woof, and the living flowers the figures. All the, trees, with all their laden branches, all the shrubs, and ferns, and grasses, the message-carrying air, all these unceasingly were active. Through the lacings of the leaves, the great sun seemed a flying shuttle weaving the unwary verger. Oh, busy weaver! Unseen weaver exclamation mark pause exclamation mark one word exclamation mark whither flows the fabric? What palace may it deck? Wherefore all these ceaseless toilings? Speak, weaver! Stay thy hand exclamation mark but one single word with thee. Nay, the shuttle flies, the figures float from forth the loom, the fresh et rushing carpet forever slides away. The weaver god, he weaves, and by that weaving is he deafened, that he hears no mortal voice, and by that humming, we, too, who look on the loom are deafened, and only when we escape it shall we hear the thousand voices that speak through it, for even so it is in all material factories. The spoken words that are inaudible among the flying spindles, those same words are plainly heard without the walls, bursting from the open casements. Thereby have villainies been detected. Ah, mortal! Then, be heedful, for so, in all the stone of the great world's loom, thy subtlest thinkings may be overheard afar. Now, amid the green, life restless, loom of that our society and wood, the great, white, worshipped skeleton lay lounging, a gigantic idler. Yet, as the ever woven verdant warp and woof intermixed and hummed around him, the mighty idler seemed the cunning weaver, himself all woven over with the vines, every month zooming greener, fresher verdure, but himself a skeleton. Life folded death, death trellis life, the grim god wived with, youthful life, and begat him curly headed glories. Now, when with royal tranquil I visited this wondrous whale, and saw the skull and altar, and the artificial smoke ascending from where the real jet had issued, I marveled that the king should regard a chapel as an object of virtue. He laughed. But more I marveled that the priest should swear that smoky jet of his was genuine. To and fro I paced, before this skeleton, brushed the vines aside, broke through the ribs, and with a ball of arse's idea and twine, wandered, eddied long amid its many winning, shaded colonnades and arbors. But soon my line was out and following it back, I emerged from the opening where I entered. I saw no living thing within, naught was there but bones. Cutting me a green measuring rod, I once more dived within the, skeleton. From their arrow slit in the skull, the priests perceived me taking the altitude of the final rib, how now? They shouted, Darst thou measure this our God? That's for us. I, priests, well, how long do ye make him, then? But hereupon a fierce contest rose among them, concerning feet and inches, they cracked each other's sconces with their yards ticks, the great skull echoed, and, seizing that lucky chance, I quickly concluded my own admeasurements. These admeasurements I now propose to set before you. But first, be it recorded, that, in this matter, I am not free to utter any fancied measurement type please. Because there are skeleton authorities you can refer to to test my accuracy. There is a Leviathanuk Museum, they tell me, in Hull, England, one of the whaling ports of, that country, where they have some fine specimens of finbacks and other whales. Likewise, I have heard that in the Museum of Manchester, in New Hampshire, they have what the proprietors call the only perfect specimen of a Greenland or a river whale in the United States. Moreover, at a place in Yorkshire, England. Burton Constable by name, a certain Sir Clifford Constable has in his possession the, skeleton of a sperm whale, but of moderate size, by no means of the full-grown magnitude of my friend King Tranquos. In both cases, the stranded whales to which these two skeletons belonged, were originally claimed by their proprietors upon similar grounds. 
King Tranquo seizing his because he wanted it, and Sir Clifford, because he was lord of the signories of those parts. Sir Clifford's wail, has been articulated throughout, so that, like a great chest of drawers, you can open and shut him, in all his bony cavities, spread out his ribs like a gigantic fan, and swing all day upon his lower jaw. Locks are to be put upon some of his trapdoors and shutters, and a footman will show round future visitors with a bunch of keys at his side. Sir Clifford thinks of charging twopence for a peep at, the whispering gallery in the spinal column, threepence to hear the echo in the hollow of his cerebellum, and sixpence for the unrivaled view from his forehead. The skeleton dimensions I shall now proceed to set down are copied verbatim from my right arm, where I had them tattooed, as in my wild wanderings at that period, there was no other secure way of preserving such valuable statistics. But, as I was crowded for space, and wished the other parts of my body to remain a blank page for a poem I was then composing, at least, what untattooed parts might remain, I did not trouble myself with the odd inches, nor, indeed, should inches at all enter into a congenial admeasurement of the way. Chapter 103. Measurement of the Whale's Skeleton. In the first place, I wish to lay before you a particular, plain statement, touching the living bulk of this Leviathan, whose skeleton we are briefly to exhibit. Such a statement may prove useful here. According to a careful calculation I have made, and which I partly base upon Captain Scoresby's estimate, of 70 tons for the largest sized, Greenland whale of 60 feet in length, According to my careful calculation, I say, a sperm whale of the largest magnitude, between 85 and 90 feet in length, and something less than 40 feet in its fullest circumference, such a whale will weigh at least 90 tons, so that, reckoning 13 men to a ton, he would considerably outweigh the combined population of a whole village, of 1,100 inhabitants. Think you not then that brains, like yoked kettle, should be put to this leviathan? to make him at all budge to any landsman's imagination? Having already in various ways put before you his skull, spout hole, jaw, teeth, tail, forehead, fins, and divers other parts, I shall now simply point out what is most interesting in the general bulk of his, unobstructed bones. But as the colossal skull embraces so very large a proportion of the entire extent of the skeleton, as it is by far the most complicated part, and as nothing is to be repeated concerning it in this chapter, you must not fail to carry it in your mind, or under your arm, as we proceed, otherwise you will not gain a complete notion of the general structure we are about to view. In, length, the sperm whale's skeleton at Trank measured 72 feet, so that when fully invested and extended in life, he must have been 90 feet long, for in the whale, the skeleton loses about one-fifth in length compared with the living body. Of this 72 feet, his skull and jaw comprised some 20 feet, leaving some 50 feet of plain backbone. Attached to this backbone, for, something less than a third of its length, was the mighty circular basket of ribs which once enclosed his vitals. To me this vast ivory rib chest, with a long, unrelieved spine, extending far away from it in a straight line, not a little resembled the hull of a great ship new laid upon the stocks, when only some twenty of her naked bow ribs are inserted, and the keel is otherwise, for the, time, but a long, disconnected timber. The ribs were tin on a side. The first, to begin from the neck, was nearly six feet long, the second, third, and fourth were each successively longer, till you came to the climax of the fifth, or one of the middle ribs, which measured eight feet and some inches. From that part, the remaining ribs diminished, till the tenth and last only spanned five feet and, some inches. In general thickness, they all bore a seemly correspondence to their length. The middle ribs were the most arched. In some of the arsacids they are used for beams whereon to lay footpath bridges over small streams. In considering these ribs, I could not but be struck anew with the circumstance so variously repeated in this book, that the skeleton of the whale is by no means the, mold of his invested form. The largest of the trank ribs, one of the middle ones, occupied that part of the fish which, in life, is greatest in depth. Now, 
the greatest depth of the invested body of this particular whale must have been at least 16 feet, whereas, the corresponding rib measured but little more than 8 feet. So that this rib only conveyed half of the true notion of the, living magnitude of that part. Besides, for some way, where I now saw but a naked spine, all that had been once wrapped round with tons of added bulk in flesh, muscle, blood, and bowels. Still more, for the ample fins, I here saw but a few disordered joints, and in place of the weighty and majestic, but boneless flukes, and utter blank. How vain and foolish, then, thought I, for timid untraveled, man to try to comprehend or write this wondrous whale, by merely poring over his dead attenuated skeleton, stretched in this peaceful wood. No. Only in the heart of quickest perils, only when within the eddyings of his angry flukes, only on the profound unbounded sea, can the fully invested whale be truly and livingly found out. But the spine. For that, the best way we can consider it is, with a, crane, to pile its bones high up on end. No speedy enterprise. But now it's done, it looks much like Pompey's pillar. There are forty and odd vertebrae in all, which in the skeleton are not locked together. They mostly lie like the great knobbed blocks on a gothic spire forming solid courses of heavy masonry. The largest, a middle one, is in width something less than three feet, and in depth more, than four. The smallest, where the spun tapers away into the tail, is only two inches in width, and looks something like a white billiard ball. I was told that there were still smaller ones, but they had been lost by some little cannibal urchins, the priest's children, who had stolen them to play marbles with. Thus we see how that the spine of even the hugest of living things tapers off at last, into simple child's play. Chapter 104. The Fossil Whale. From his minor bulk the whale affords a most congenial theme whereon to enlarge, amplify, and generally expatiate. Would you, you could not compress him by good rights he should only be treated of an imperial folio. Not to tell over again his furlongs from spiracle to tail, and the yards he measures about the waist, only think of the gigantic involutions of his, intestines, where they lie in him like great cables and hawsers coiled away in the subterranean oil op deck of a line of battleship. Since I have undertaken to manhandle this leviathan, it behooves me to approve myself omnisciently exhaustive in the enterprise not overlooking the minutest seminal germs of his blood, and spinning him out to the uttermost coil of his bowels. Having already described, him in most of his present habitatory and anatomical peculiarities, it now remains to magnify him in an archaeological, fossiliferous, and antediluvian point of view. Applied to any other creature than the leviathan, to an ant or a flea, such portly terms might justly be deemed unwarrantably grandiloquent. But when Leviathan is the text, the case is altered. Fain am I to stagger to this emprise, under the weightiest words of the dictionary. And here be it said, that whenever it has been convenient to consult one in the course of these dissertations, I have invariably used a huge quarto edition of Johnson, expressly purchased for that purpose, because that famous lexicographer's uncommon personal bulk more fitted him to compile a lexicon to be used by a whale author like me. One often, hears of writers that rise and swell with their subject, though it may seem but an ordinary one. How, then, with me, writing of this Leviathan? Unconsciously my chirography expands into placard capitals. Give me a condor's quill. Give me Vesuvius crater for an inkstand. Friends, hold my arms. For in the mere act of pinning my thoughts of this Leviathan, they weary me, and make me faint with their outreaching comprehensiveness of sweep, as if to include the whole circle of the sciences, and all the generations of whales, and men, and mastodons, past, present, and to come, with all the revolving panoramas of empire on earth, and throughout the whole universe, not excluding its suburbs. Such, and so magnifying, is the virtue of a large and liberal theme. We expand to its bulk. To produce a, mighty book, you must choose a mighty theme. No great and enduring volume can ever be written on the flea, though many there be who have tried it. Ere entering upon the subject of fossil whales, I present my credentials as a geologist, 
by stating that in my miscellaneous time I have been a stonemason, and also a great digger of ditches, canals and wells, wine vaults, cellars, and cisterns of all sorts. Likewise, by way of preliminary, I desire to remind the reader, that while in the earlier geological strata there are found the fossils of monsters now almost completely extinct, the subsequent relics discovered in what are called the tertiary formations seem the connecting, or at any rate intercepted links, between the antichronical creatures, and those whose remote posterity are said to, have entered the ark, all the fossil whales hitherto discovered belong to the tertiary period, which is the last preceding the superficial formations. And though none of them precisely answer to any known species of the present time, they are yet sufficiently akin to them in general respects, to justify their taking rank as cetacean fossils. Detached broken fossils of pre-Adamite whales, fragments of their bones and skeletons, have within thirty years past, at various intervals, been found at the base of the Alps, in Lombardy, in France, in England, in Scotland, and in the states of Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama. Among the more curious of such remains is part of a skull, which in the year 1779 was disinterred in the Rue Dauphine in Paris, a short street opening almost directly upon the Palace of the Tuileries, and bones disinterred in excavating the great docks of Antwerp, in Napoleon's time. Cuvier pronounced these fragments to have belonged to some utterly unknown Leviathanic species. But by far the most wonderful of all cetacean relics was the almost complete vast skeleton of an extinct monster, found in the year 1842, on the plantation of Judge Creek, in Alabama. The, awestruck and credulous slaves in the vicinity took it for the bones of one of the fallen angels. The Alabama doctors declared it a huge reptile, and bestowed upon it the name of Basilosaurus. But some specimen bones of it being taken across the sea to Owen the English anatomist, it turned out that this alleged reptile was a whale, though of a departed species. A significant illustration of the, fact, again and again repeated in this book, that the skeleton of the whale furnishes but little clue to the shape of his fully invested body. So o and rechristen the monster Zuglidon, and in his paper read before the London Geological Society, pronounced it, in substance, one of the most extraordinary creatures which the mutations of the globe have blotted out of existence. When I stand among, these mighty leviathan skeletons, skulls, tusks, jaws, ribs, and vertebrae, all characterized by partial resemblances to the existing breeds of sea monsters, but at the same time bearing on the other hand similar affinities to the annihilated anachronical leviathans, their incalculable seniors, I am, by a flood, Born back to that wondrous period, ere time itself can be said to have begun, for, time began with man. Here Saturn's grey chaos rolls over me, and I obtain dim, shuddering glimpses into those polar eternities, when wedge bastions of ice pressed hard upon what are now the tropics, and in all the twenty-five thousand miles of this world's circumference, not an inhabitable hand's breadth of land was visible. Then the whole world was the whales, and, king of creation, he left his wake along, the present lines of the Andes and the Himalayas. Who can show a pedigree like Leviathan? Ahab's harpoon had shed older blood than the pharaohs. Methuselah seems a schoolboy. I look round to shake hands with Shem. I am horror-struck at this antimosaic, unsourced existence of the unspeakable terrors of the whale, which, having been before all time, must needs exist after all humane ages are over. But not alone has this Leviathan left his pre Adamite traces in the stereotype plates of nature, and in limestone and marl bequeathed his ancient bust, but upon Egyptian tablets, whose antiquity seems to claim for them an almost fossiliferous character, we find the unmistakable print of his fin. In an apartment of the great temple of Dendera, some fifty years ago, there was discovered upon the granite ceiling a sculptured and painted planisphere, abounding in centaurs griffins, and dolphins, similar to the grotesque figures on the celestial globe of the moderns. Gliding among them, old Leviathan swam as of yore, was there swimming in that planisphere, centuries before Solomon was cradled. Nor must there be omitted another strange attestation of the antiquity of the whale, in his own, osseous post-diluvian reality, as set down by the venerable John Leo, 
the old Barbary traveler. Not far from the seaside, they have a temple, the rafters and beams of which are made of whale bones, for whales of a monstrous size are oftentimes cast up dead upon that shore. The common people imagine, that by a secret power bestowed by God upon the temple, no whale can pass it without immediate, death. But the truth of the matter is, that on neither side of the temple, there are rocks that shoot two miles into the sea, and wound the whales when they light upon him. They keep a whale's rib of an incredible length for a miracle, which lying upon the ground with its convex part uppermost, makes an arch, the head of which cannot be reached by a man upon a camel's back. This rib, says John Leo, is said to have lain there a hundred years before I saw it. Their historians affirm, that a prophet who prophesied of Muhammad, came from this temple, and some do not stand to assert, that the prophet Jonas was cast forth by the whale at the base of the temple. In this Afric temple of the whale I leave you, reader, and if you be an Nantucketer, and a whaleman, you will silently worship there. Chapter 105. Does the whale's magnitude diminish? Question mark, will he perish? Inasmuch, then, as this Leviathan comes floundering down upon us from the headwaters of the eternities, it may be fitly inquired, whether, in the long course of his generations, he has not degenerated from the original bulk of his sires. But upon investigation we find that not only are the whales of the present day superior in magnitude to those whose fossil remains are found in the tertiary system, embracing a distinct geological period prior to man, but of the whales found in that tertiary system, those belonging to its latter formations exceed in size those of its earlier ones. Of all the preadamite whales yet exhumed, by far the largest is the Alabama one mentioned in the last chapter, and that was less than, 70 feet in length in the skeleton. Whereas, we have already seen, that the tape measure gives 72 feet for the skeleton of a large-sized modern whale. And I have heard, on whalemen's authority, that sperm whales have been captured near a hundred feet long at the time of capture. But may it not be, that while the whales of the present hour are in advance in magnitude upon those of all, previous geological periods, may it not be, that since Adam's time they have degenerated? Assuredly, we must conclude so if we are to credit the accounts of such gentlemen as Pliny, and the ancient naturalists generally. For Pliny tells us of whales that embrace takers of living bulk, and Aldrovandus of others which measured 800 feet in length, rope walks and Thames tunnels of whales, and even in the days of Banks and Solander, Cook's naturalists, we find a Danish member of the Academy of Sciences setting down certain Iceland whales, red and Kerr, or wrinkled bellies at 120 yards, that is, 360 feet. And Lacepede, the French naturalist, in his elaborate history of whales, in the very beginning of his work, page 3, sets down the right, whale at 100 meters, 328 feet. And this work was published so late as AD 1825. But will any whaleman believe these stories? No. The whale of today is as big as his ancestors in Pliny's time. And if ever I go where Pliny is, I, a whaleman, more than he was, will make bold to tell him so. Because I cannot understand how it is, that while the Egyptian mummies, that were buried thousands of years before even Pliny was born, do not measure so much in their coffins as a modern Kentuckian in his socks, and while the cattle and other animals sculptured on the oldest Egyptian and Nineveh tablets, by the relative proportions in which they are drawn, just as plainly prove that the hybrid, stall-fed, prize cattle of Smithfield, not only equal, but far exceed, in magnitude the fattest of Pharaoh's fat kine, in the face of all this, I will not admit that of all animals the whale alone should have degenerated. But still another inquiry remains, one often agitated by the more recondite Nantucketers. Whether owing to the almost omniscient lookouts at the mastheads of the whale ships, now penetrating even through Bering's Straits, and into the remotest, secret drawers and lockers of the world, and the thousand harpoons and lances darted along all continental coasts, the moot point is, whether Leviathan can long endure so wide a chase, and so remorseless a havoc, whether he must not at last be exterminated from the waters, and the last whale, like the last man, smoke his last pipe, 
and then himself evaporate in the final puff. Comparing the humped herds of whales with the humped herds of buffalo, which, not 40 years ago, overspread by tens of thousands the prairies of Illinois and Missouri, and shook their iron manes and scowled with their thunder clotted brows upon the sites of populous river capitals, where now the polite broker sells you land at a dollar an inch, in such a comparison an irresistible argument would seem furnished, too, show that the hunted whale cannot now escape speedy extinction. But you must look at this matter in every light. Though so short a period ago, not a good lifetime, the census of the buffalo in Illinois exceeded the census of men now in London, and though at the present day not one horn or hoof of them remains in all that region, and though the cause of this wondrous extermination was the spear of, man, yet the far different nature of the whale hunt peremptorily forbids so inglorious an end to the leviathan. Forty men in one ship hunting the sperm whales for four to eight months think they have done extremely well, and thank God, if at last they carry home the oil of forty fish. Whereas, in the days of the old Canadian and Indian hunters and trappers of the West, when the far West, in whose, sunset suns still rise, was a wilderness and a virgin, the same number of moccasin men, for the same number of months, mounted on horse instead of sailing in ships would have slain not forty, but forty thousand and more buffaloes, a fact that, if need were, could be statistically stated. Nor, considered aright, does it seem any argument in favor of the gradual extinction of the sperm whale. For example, that in former years, the latter part of the last century, say, these leviathans, in small pods, were encountered much oftener than at present, and, in consequence, the voyages were not so prolonged, and were also much more remunerative. Because, as has been elsewhere noticed, those whales, influenced by some views to safety, now swim the seas in immense caravans, so that to a large, degree the scattered solitaries, yokes, and pods, and schools of other days are now aggregated into vast but widely separated, unfrequent armies. That is all. And equally fallacious seems the conceit that because the so-called whalebone whales no longer haunt many grounds in former years abounding with them, hence that species also is declining. For they are only being driven from promontory to, cape, and if one coast is no longer enlivened with their jets, then, be sure, some other and remoter strand has been very recently startled by the unfamiliar spectacle. Furthermore, concerning these last-mentioned leviathans, they have two firm fortresses, which, in all human probability, will forever remain impregnable. And as upon the invasion of their valleys, the frosty Swiss have retreated, to their mountains, so, hunted from the savannas and glades of the Middle Seas, the whalebone whales can at last resort to their polar citadels, and diving under the ultimate glassy barriers and walls there, come up among icy fields and flows, and in a charmed circle of everlasting December, bid defiance to all pursuit from man. But as perhaps fifty of these whalebone whales are harpooned for, one cachalot, some philosophers of the forecastle have concluded that this positive havoc has already very seriously diminished their battalions. But though for some time past a number of these whales, not less than 13,000, have been annually slain on the Norwest coast by the Americans alone, yet there are considerations which render even this circumstance of little or no account as an opposing argument in this matter. Natural as it is to be somewhat incredulous concerning the populousness of the more enormous creatures of the globe, yet what shall we say to Hardo, the historian of Goa, when he tells us that at one hunting the king of Siam took 4,000 elephants, that in those regions elephants are numerous as droves of cattle in the temperate climes? And there seems no reason to doubt, that if these elephants, which have now been hunted for thousands of years, by Semiramis, by Porus, by Hannibal, and by all the successive monarchs of the East, if they still survive there in great numbers, much more made the great whale at last all hunting, since he has a pasture to expatiate in, which is precisely twice as large as all Asia, both Americas, Europe and Africa, New Holland, and all, the Isles of the Sea combined. Moreover, we are to consider, that from the presumed great longevity of whales, they're probably attaining the age of a century and more. Therefore at any one period of time, several distinct adult generations must be contemporary. And what that is, 
we may soon gain some idea of, by imagining all the graveyards, cemeteries, and family vaults of creation yielding up, the live bodies of all the men, women, and children who were alive 75 years ago, and adding this countless host to the present human population of the globe. Wherefore, for all these things, we account the whale immortal in his species, however perishable in his individuality. He swam the seas before the continents broke water, he once swam over the side of the Tuileries, and Windsor, Castle, and the Gremlin. In Noah's flood he despised Noah's Ark, and if ever the world is to be again flooded, like the Netherlands, to kill off its rats, then the eternal whale will still survive, and rearing upon the topmost crest of the equatorial flood, spout his frothed defiance to the skies.